So, um, my talk today is going to be um, an introductory talk to GraphQL. Um, I named it Rest in Peace, Long Live GraphQL, and it's a, kind of a clickbaity title. And I'm saying that it's clickbait, you know, and a speech is not so much, you know, valid, but uh, it still is. Let's, uh, I, I want to just quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Peter Tsubik, I'm Senior Software Consultant at Rising Stack. Uh, you can find me by this handle. Um, you can use this handle to find the bit.ly links, um, NodeBP slides and NodeBP code for all the resources. Um, they are public on the internet. If they're not, hope, hope they are. But if they're not, let me know and then we can fix that. I do stuff with Node, been doing that for, for quite a while now, playing around with some fancy languages like Rust, which I totally recommend, is awesome. And uh, let's begin. So let's, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the state, the current state of the front end and API development and how they are um, interacting with each other. So we have this. Um, we have, we have, in our story, we have Vela, we have Ferry and the manager guy. Um, they are all collaborating with each other. They're working as a team to achieve great things. And um, they are there to help each other out. And one day, the manager comes over to Vela our backend guy, and then tells him, okay, we need this, we have this totally new, cool startup idea that we are, are that's gonna change our business. And um, he walks up to Fetty as well, and he says, okay, we need the user API. And they both try to collaborate and come up with something like this. Okay, so there's users post, and um, <laughs> users post will create, you know, there's a first name, there's last name, and there's email. And uh, they're going to create an endpoint, and they all agree on there's going to be this format. And it's going to return this fields, and the users slash, uh, slash users get will return all the users. And you can return the user by ID by just calling that endpoint. And they can move on with their lives, work on this stuff. It's going to, uh, it's going to be awesome. Management is happy. They implemented all the features that they talked about. But one day, you know, after some time passed, um, Manager comes along and asks backend, okay, I want this huge collection of fields saved for analytic purposes, because that's what management does, you know, they try to come up with some stuff for analytic purposes. And then he says, okay, goes on with his life, and then management is happy again. All the fields are implemented, they're like in the DB, they're like at least, you know, 700 fields, uh, relations and, and whatnot. But for the front end, nothing has changed. Uh, just some time again pass, and then um, management comes along again. Okay, they got this new idea. We want to visualize a new field on the user entity in our system. And Fetty is like, oh, well, okay, I need to ask, um, I need to ask Bela for for that uh, for that exact thing to be on the API response, because otherwise it's not going to be that much of fun, you know, just mock data and all. So he asks him. And there he goes, implementing his stuff. And then one day, a uh, manager comes again. Okay, we want this new relation on that, and we want to visualize it. I know it's saved on the back end. You just have to ask Bela to expose it. And then he walks up to him again, and manager comes again, and again, and they do the same thing for all of the 700 fields that are in the user entity. And after some time, you see, Bela gets kind of, um, gets kind of upset about it. <laughs> and so here, um, so here, Bela is like, there must be a better way to do this. I don't want to add all of these fields one by one. How about I could just define the whole schema, all the relations at once, and then just, you know, pick, the, the front end could just pick and choose. There's a tool for that. And this tool is called GraphQL. And GraphQL allows backend to implement all the 100 million numbers of fields on the API, and the front end can just pick and choose what they want. No adjustments, no, ac no extra interactions. Well, as my colleagues pointed out from our past experiences, not no adjustments, it's just less adjustments required, usually. And the backend can define the data domain, the backend define the connection, in between those entities in the system, and the front end can do whatever they want with it. And uh, this introduces a kind of a decoupling 
in between uh, the front end and the back end and allows developers to express the shapes of back end developers usually to express the shape of and the connections between the different entities in, in our systems. And it has the same kind of resource definition that we are used to with REST. So we have, we have all the resources there and we can interact with them. But, but GraphQL is basically built with modern applications, well, modern web applications in mind, modern interactive web applications. Unlike, you know, HTTP, which is basically originally built for sharing documents over, over TCP, like for scientific purposes in the 70s, that's basically a kind of improvement on it. And uh, uh, GraphQL has uh, method definitions at its core, so there's no more hacking, in, including method names in the URL, like slash user, user ID, like, or anything um, at the end. So GraphQL, I just want to define what, what that is. And uh, GraphQL is usually um, misunderstood because GraphQL itself is just a language, it's just a query language that we can use to achieve those, those things that I mentioned. It is a query language which is statically typed, uh, it's self-documenting, very, very accessible, has good discoverability. I'm going to show examples of uh, what I mean by that. And it has very good library and IDE support. There are a bunch of libraries available already, like GraphQL, uh, Voyager, uh, Apollo libraries, which I'm going to talk about later. And there's this, um, you can check out, there's a whole awesome list. Uh, if you're not familiar, there are awesome lists of everything on GitHub. And you can find awesome resources for um, interacting with the GraphQL API. Uh, and it's, uh, GraphQL itself is very extensible, you can define your own types and you can use them in your API and it's basically going to be transport layer agnostic, it doesn't really care where you are going to send these uh, GraphQL queries over, it's just going to be like uh, uh, sitting there and the, the transport layer is not, it's just up to the implementation. And uh, this, it is also storage layer agnostic, so it doesn't matter where you are storing it. It could be using other REST APIs, it could be using a database, it could, it could be using a static JSON file. It's up to the implementation again. And um, you can use GraphQL anywhere, basically. It's, it's just a language that you can use either internally or over any existing transport layer like HTTP. And uh, think of GraphQL as JavaScript. Without, without the runtime, without the, all the libraries that we have, it's not so much fun. So that's why um, a bunch of people implemented a uh, uh, lot of libraries on top of it. But the thing is, it has like a formal specification that you can read, which is usually meant for very um, you know, scientific IT people. So I wouldn't really recommend if you're um, just beginning uh, using it. So, um, and there is a parser available in most languages. So it's not just, not, it's not just for Node.js, it's not just for JavaScript, but it's basically for Python, for Java, for Rust, and all, all the languages probably have uh, support already. And um, how people usually use it is GraphQL over HTTP, and the flow is basically the clients can specify a query and all the variables in some way, 